Hi, my name is Ben Cook, and I'm Vice President of Laxabanius LLC, a firm that advises companies and governments in complex negotiations, as well as the founder of Red Pill Strategies, a boutique strategy shop focused on helping organizations navigate the many high stakes challenges they face operating in today's 24 seven digital jungle. For today's webinar, what I'd like you all to keep in mind is that we're really dealing with something revolutionary. Like David said just a minute ago, digital media has disrupted everything about our world. But if we look around, too many businesses today are stuck in this outdated mindset where they view social media as just another channel for their existing strategies. But the internet is not merely a new medium. It creates entirely new capabilities and paradigms and that's what makes it so disruptive in field after field. But because embracing this change requires developing entirely new strategies that are native to the digital age, its transformative impact on negotiations has gone largely untapped. And so many negotiators these days are lined up like the British in the Revolutionary War. Very well funded, very sharp uniforms, but with giant targets painted on their chests. In our previous webinars, we've told you some about how to play defense in this new area. Today, we're gonna to be getting very practical about how businesses of any size facing any number of challenges can make use of some of these paradigm changing shifts to gain crucial advantages in their most important negotiations. But first, a quick note before we dive in. As Professor Sabanius mentioned just a second ago, one of the crucial things to keep in mind as we walk through this case today is the ethical considerations inherent in doing this kind of analysis, particularly around privacy. Now, in this instance, all of the details have already been made public, and we've spoken with several of the key players to get the, their consent to share their information. But out of an overabundance of caution, we're also taking this proactive step of blinding all the names, identifying details, and even the faces of the individuals we've analyzed. So in this webinar, I'll be walking you through a blinded case study in how businesses can use open source information available publicly on the internet to gain or mitigate against information asymmetries in their negotiations. Our case study focuses on the man you see here, who we'll call Adam Kingston. We'll be discussing his company, a legal cannabis business we'll refer to as Canna Productions, and their experience negotiating with the disguised town of Old Haven, Massachusetts. So I'll start by giving a quick background before spending the majority of our time talking about the specific findings we've uncovered using so open source social media intelligence. So Adam Kingston is an entrepreneur who capitalized on the medical marijuana market to build a $10 million production facility in the town of Old Haven, Massachusetts, where he was a quiet corporate citizen for several years. But when the state unexpectedly legalized recreational marijuana, a provision of that legislation allowed municipalities to ban pot businesses by referendum. And in Old Haven, a local mom began a grassroots campaign to try and bar legal cannabis from the town. Now, this initially targeted only retail establishments, but it was later expanded through a somewhat underhanded secretive process to include Adam Kingston's existing production facility as well. This posed an existential threat to his business. And so he hired a well-regarded, rather famous outside firm to mount an aggressive campaign to try and persuade the town not to outlaw his business. You can see here a mailer that they sent out accusing the town of doing something fishy with the referendum. It looks like standard PR tactics, but this was received incredibly poorly. Old Haven is a small, tight-knit, family values type town, and this mailer was seen as overly slick, too aggressive, and totally out of step with the community. There's an asymmetry here. The anti-pot activists knew their community intimately but the seemingly tried and true tactics from these outside experts backfired dramatically. And so as a result, when the ballot measure came around, Adam Kingston lost and faced imminent bankruptcy. But as Kingston belatedly discovered, due to a quirk in the way these small New England towns are run, in order for this referendum to come into effect, 
the results had to be affirmed in what's called a town meeting, essentially a local legislative body with over 200 members. This provided a narrow window of 30 days during which Adam Kingston might be able to persuade the town meeting to adopt a carve out, altering the referendum to grandfather in pre-existing businesses like Canna Productions. By negotiating carefully with the anti-pot activists and key community leaders, he might just supersede the election that his PR firm had bungled and head off financial ruin. So Kingston brought in a new strategist with more experience in this kind of hyperlocal setting. And together with his team, they assembled a war room where they carefully mapped out by hand which town meetings might be supporters, green, opponents, red, or persuadables, yellow. Going around the room, they brainstormed on who on the team might have personal relationships with influential people in town that they could tap to make their case. And in particular, they zeroed in on the local mom behind this grassroots campaign as the key factor in shaping their outcome. Get her on board, and perhaps a deal could be made to avert disaster. So this is where we'll begin our case study, at this crucial moment when Kingston has just 30 days to tap into whatever personal relationships he can uncover in a hyper-local setting to win over the 200-person town meeting, and in particular, the grassroots mom activist who just spent the last several months campaigning vigorously to have his business kicked out of town. So without the benefit of social media intelligence, including modern data analytics tools and digital fluency in this campaign, Adam Kingston was forced to rely on interpersonal instinct, the so-called expertise of the outside firm he'd hired, whose approach was largely stuck in the pre-social media era, and ultimately a significant amount of luck in the form of personal relationships as he sought to persuade an activist to change her mind and community leaders to take up his cause. So our goal here is to replace this combination of instinct and luck with data-backed social media intelligence. Specifically, we're developing approaches to better learn about the dynamics on the ground, influence key parties, and then mobilize supporters or neutralize blocking coalitions in an effective way, all on an extremely tight timetable. Now, the key challenge in this work, as anyone attempting it finds very quickly, is that even in a town of just 30,000 people like Old Haven, in today's digital age, there are literally millions of data points available publicly over the internet, haystacks and haystacks of data to sift through. It is immensely difficult to go through and sort out which aspects are relevant or useful to developing strategy and tactics, and not just gonna be a distraction to negotiators. So we've borrowed powerful tools from fields like investigative journalism and human rights researchers, originally developed for applications like studying the social media posts from the Syrian civil war to track Russian war crimes. These pioneering techniques form what's called open source intelligent or OSINT, a discipline that helps identify relevant public data on a faster, more systematized basis. Of course, unlike investigations of chemical weapons attacks or shot down airliners, our approach is very sensitive to privacy concerns, as you can see from the fact we've anonymized most of this case, even though it was widely covered in local media. So using open source research techniques, we've sifted through reams of public data about the town, key community groups, local leaders, and the personal connections and psychographic profiles of opponents, persuadables, and potential supporters alike, providing what could have proved a pivotal edge when it came to learning about all the relevant parties and their interests. As an example of the potential in this work, we're gonna take a look first at Adam Kingston's chief counterparty, the local mom activist I mentioned, and explore the ways in which you might learn more about her motivations and values to engage with her more effectively, foster the development of more friendly coalitions, and finally interrupt the formation of hostile coalitions. While this example is a high stakes corporate situation at a hyperlocal scale, the same techniques we're talking about can be pro applied proactively to great effect across any manner of negotiation scenarios. So our main counterparty is a woman who we'll call Debbie Zimmerman. She is a small town suburban mom with a mid-level job in a Boston area biotech firm. 
from our conversations with Adam Kingston, we know she is steeped in the stigma around marijuana. And you see her here holding a sign that says, don't make Old Haven the pot destination. She's worried. She's afraid that the town where her family has lived for generations will be tarnished with the image of potheads, pot dealers, and pot culture. She's a conservative, and she doesn't like the countercultural element associated with marijuana. But at the same time, if you look at the pages she follows on Facebook, well, her main source of health, wellness, and fitness information is this account, who regularly posts content supporting the use of THC in specific medical conditions, or CBD, to treat broader health issues like back pain. Then if you look at her public Instagram account, the yoga studio she likes posts content like this. While at a conscious level, she may be steeped in the stigma around marijuana use, she also exists in this broader culture that you could describe as either pro-cannabis or cannabis adjacent. So if you're looking for a way to engage with Debbie more effectively, you might borrow language, imagery, framing, and arguments from trusted sources like these, which will be much more likely to be met with a positive reception as opposed to the maybe more pro-business arguments you might make elsewhere in town. So another detail that stands out again and again in Mrs. Zimmerman's posts show her concern with the image of the town. That shows up in post after post about pot ruining the town's reputation. But she also volunteers every year at the town's annual cleanup day, which they call Beautification Day. It's an event that brings local media, Girl Scout troops, and nearby businesses to help pick up trash in the area. So as a tactical application of these insights, if Debbie is concerned about the impact that these pot people might have on the town's image, why not have Adam Kingston show up with a couple of trucks and some local employees from his facility and pitch in, volunteer to help clean up the town together? And while at the event, they might even strike up some informal, human-to-human, neighborly conversations. Again, this is just one potential approach among dozens that stand out from our research. So now let's turn to the task of fostering friendly coalitions and take a quick look through the local media channels and Facebook groups. This man you see here on the left, we'll call him Brian Hunt, is a local real estate agent. He's an aspiring conservative politician in the area, and he is very active across many community forums online. His job is building a deep local network, and public real estate records show that he has listed and sold properties in the commercial business district where Adam Kingston's facility is located in Old Haven. What's more, if you look at Brian's Facebook page, you can see that he supports several state-level Republican legislators who have come out in favor of cannabis legalization, either to help treat PTSD for veterans or for the sheer tax benefits. So as a potential target for outreach, Brian might be very receptive to this idea that this anti-cannabis referendum could cast a pal over the commercial viability of Old Haven's business district, where he has a commercial interest. And given his extensive local network, he could be a key outpost for the conservative community in town. Well, Brian may or may not prove useful a quick conversation with him could have cleared this up, there is almost no way that the hit or miss methods of the pre-social media age would have been able to identify him as a possible advocate. And here's another tactical application. On the town government's website, all 226 town meeting members are listed along with their home addresses, which we've blinded here. Now, this obviously raises some significant privacy considerations and makes you wonder why on earth they would publish this information in the first place, but a limited ethical application might be to ask people like Brian Hunt to speak with others who might be persuadable. You can see here a map with green, yellow, and red members, but why not have the green supporters strike up conversations with their yellow neighbors when they run into each other on the block? Now let's end with some thoughts on interrupting the formation of hostile blocking coalitions. Take a woman we'll call Carolyn Carlton, who you see here speaking on the right. She is a local substance abuse and mental health counselor who partners closely with the police department and the school board on substance abuse issues. Unsurprisingly, 
she's actively anti-marijuana. On the left is a flyer that she posted to LinkedIn warning about higher THC levels and new strains of wheat. But the overwhelming focus of the networking breakfast you see pictured here is on opioid addiction and recovery. And there has been a massive volume of research about the potential benefits of cannabis use for recovering opioid addicts. Now, these arguments probably aren't going to convince Carolyn to actively support cannabis in her town, but what if Kingston were to embrace this cause and become active in the anti-opioid communities in town? This would be a low-cost action on his part, and he might be able to position Canna Productions as a visible ally of this cause, potentially peeling away some group members or creating divisions within this coalition around, around a wedge issue like this so that her anti-drug network doesn't emerge as a key blocking vote with the police department, the school board, and other local leaders. In this way, open source intelligence research might have proved extremely helpful in helping effectively neutralize this key opponent with such strong influence over local leaders. So now that we've walked through a few of these specific examples for how open source data modern analytic tools and social media intelligence might have helped Kingston learn, influence, mobilize, and neutralize effectively. What actually happened in Old Haven? Well, in the end, thanks to the heroic efforts from his team and smart instincts from his new strategist, Kingston was able to orchestrate a series of personal introductions, calling in some favors, and eventually land a meeting with a trusted longtime community leader who agreed to take up his cause and advocate before the town meeting, as well as to arrange a detente between Kingston and Zimmerman. No easy feat and a tense negotiation, to be sure. But ultimately, this approach was successful, and Canna Productions won that carve-out and got grandfathered in to Old Haven. Great news, but a nail-biter that easily could have turned out negatively for Kingston. In hindsight, making effective use of social media and OSINT techniques even at a hyper-local scale under an extremely tight timetable, might have proven pivotal in shaping the outcome of Canna Productions' negotiations with the town. Again, these are just a handful example of examples, and there are plenty more we could have spoken about, from an extremely well-connected, well-respected school nurse to dozens of other micro-influencers in town with a potential interest in saving Canna Productions. Armed with the tools and techniques of open source social media intelligence, there is a wealth of untapped, potentially game-changing information available about virtually any negotiation scenario. In fact, when we presented this analysis to Kingston in an interview after the fact, he told us the following. The primary technique that we used was sort of word of mouth, personal connections, friends of friends, people that had personal connections that could use the telephone to make this, this outreach. In, in hindsight, it would be extraordinarily valuable to have a, a playbook um, that could be quickly in a day or two internalized for how to utilize social media to go and find, uh, to basically go and map the space. Uh, and then also to root out and find who, who you know, we have a finite list of people who are sitting on town meeting. I mean, that would be very easy to, to, to basically troll Facebook and, and listen to what they're saying. And I mean, you know this better than I do. This is what you're doing. But like, as I hear you talking, it's sort of you know, light bulbs are just going off all around. I mean, people are just giving you this stuff for free. I mean, it's right there. People typically just lay it all out. Um, and so, yeah, I think it would have been extraordinary valid, extraordinarily valuable. Uh, and then it seems like uh, we could have been even more effective at really personalizing uh, communications with folks based on what they've expressed their hopes and dreams and desires are. So while Kingston was operating within an extremely tight time frame, our research has shown that modern analytical tools, sophisticated OSINT techniques, and a deep understanding of social media intelligence can produce immensely valuable insights within tremendously short turnaround time virtually anywhere in the world at almost any scale. Thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Jim for some quick discussion before we open it up to audience Q&A. 